Okay, here we are. We are in the six constant mitzvot. We're now going to be looking at the mitzvah of the belief that Hashem is one. We've covered, uh, previously we've covered uh, emuna, faith in Hashem. We saw what that was about, the second commandment, lo tihiyeh, that there should be no other God before you. So now we come to this one. And the, the Chinuch says that we are commanded to understand that Hashem, blessed be He, is a cause for all that exists. The master of all, the one and only, without any partnership whatsoever, as the verse states, Hear, O Israel, Hashem, our God, Hashem is one. The, this, command, this verse is a commandment, not merely a declaration. The definition of Shema is therefore, accept from me, know and believe that Hashem, who is our God, is one. It is clear from Midrashic sources that this is a commandment, for Chazal frequently say, that one should unify Hashem's name, thus accepting upon himself the yoke of heaven. For, uh, by example, the declaration of the unity of Hashem, of Hashem and have faith in it. Okay, now we're on page 127, and we're looking at Hashem's oneness. It says, when World War II ended, thousands of Jewish children were in Christian orphanages across Europe. Nearly all of the parents who had placed their children in care of the priests and nuns to protect them from the impending doom had not survived the war, and no one remained to claim the orphans. Many of the children were, were, young, were so young at the outset of the war that they had few memories of family or Judaism. Rabbi Eliezer Silver, president of the, Uni of the Union of Orthodox Unions of, uh, Rabbi, of the Orthodox Rabbis of the United States and Canada, otherwise known as the OU, traveled to Europe to try to find such children and to bring them back to Judaism. Mm. The priests and nuns often denied that there were Jewish children in their institutions and tried to send them off empty-handed. Rabbi Silver, traveling in the uniform of a U.S. Army colonel, demanded the right to visit the dining room. Once there, he would call it the words, Shema Israel, Hashem Elokeinu. In almost every orphanage, children stirred by a memory ingrained, de ingrained from birth would join him in the chant of Hashem Echad. And they would know that he's Jewish, they would pull him out. It's a famous story. Okay, so now it says, the source of Yichud Hashem, the unity of Hashem, the uniqueness of Hashem, the third of the constant mitzvot, is the verse Shema Israel Hashem Lokeinu Hashem, Haga, Hashem Echad, and namely, listen, Israel, Hashem is our God, Hashem is the one and only. He adds, that's an art school edition, wow. one and only. Okay, the Rambam, uh, the Rambam is in the introduction to the Mishnah, writes that humans are superior to other creatures in only one respect: <clears throat> they are able to attain the wisdom necessary. To understand the oneness of Hashem. And he says in his note, on a basic level, the oneness of Hashem means that although there are manif manifestations of Hashem's presence in our lives that seem to differ sharply from one another, they all come from one source, the Orgid del Yahu, which was the Rosh Yeshiva of uh, Torah Vadas, I believe. So, uh, Rabbi Shor compares this concept to, the, to light being diffused by a prism. We see many colors emanating from a prism, but we realize that all of those colors are produced from only one ray of light. So too, the perception that makes it seem as though we are being controlled by different attributes at different times, divine kindness, justice, judgment, mercy, anger, to, to name a few, lies in our inability as mortals to perceive the harmony in Hashem's ways. Hashem is one. It is we who fail to understand his oneness. So the greatest achievement of human intelligence, it continues, is to attain clarity in the oneness of Hashem. Clearly then, we are about to embark on the study of a fundamental mitzvah. The first and most obvious question that comes to mind is why Yichud Hashem, this, again, this uh, one and, how do you say it? The one and onlyness of Hashem is classified as a constant mitzvah. Shema Yisrael is indeed the pledge of allegiance of the Jewish people. And we aspire to have these words on our lips as we die. But we are commanded to recite the, sh the chapters of Shema and to declare the oneness of Hashem twice a day. Why then does the Chinuch 
classified as one of the constant mitzvot. Furthermore, in Amuna, we established that Hashem exists and created the world for one purpose, namely for us to have an attachment with God. And in Lohihia, he we added that no other force, even one subservient to him, could contain any independent power. What are we adding with the mitzvah of Yichud Hashem? In order, to answer, uh, in order to find answers to these questions and appreciate the depth of the mitzvah, we must first define the statement of that Hashem, Elokeinu Hashem Echad. There are four points that can, we can derive from the verse, Hashem is our God, Hashem is one. Each of the four is valid, but only one of them explains why Yichud Hashem is a constant mitzvah. It says there is one God, one and not what? two, three, or fifty? While certainly valid, such a definition would limit the mitzvah of Yichud Hashem to being a positive form of Lohiyyeh. There should be no other gods before you. And as he's, he, in the notes he says, as we have pointed out in the previous mitzvah, in order to qualify as a constant mitzvah, one, one that we should be thinking about every second of our lives, a mitzvah must have a some unique characteristic over the others. So it can't just be a positive of the negative. That's his point. In addition, polytheism does not seem to be an issue that plagues people to the extent that Torah must command us to recite this verse twice daily and as our souls depart for the world of truth. Furthermore, and by the way, I want to think about that, for even for most religions, Christianity and Islam, regardless of what we're going to say as Jews, that they, they could be polytheistic in nature, if you would ask the adherents of those religions, they're going to tell you that they're monotheistic. They'll all say they're monotheistic. Regardless of how you slice three equals one and so on and so forth, they're holding they're monotheistic. So that's what he's saying. We don't, we're not really plagued by people who are in major religions going to different gods. If you're a pagan, okay, so then you're going to have... Or a, a what? Or a Hindu. I'm saying, I was going to say pagan or a Buddha, a Buddhist Hindu. So then you have multiple gods. But uh, again, for the, the, the three major religions, if you will, of the world, we're not really plagued by that. And people aren't really running. Even, again, even the Christians who have all the icon... I, there's a word for that. Icon, iconography. Iconography, that's what it's called? Okay. Yes, but Okay, so even they, even they recognize again. Oh, uh, I'll say my celebration. We just saw lightning. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. Good. Got to both. Uh, both them. Hey, there you go. Okay, Hashem get, wants to give us mitzvot. So the, uh, but I'm saying that I guess he's agreeing, or he's really angry with me for saying it. I'm sure. But, but even they hold that they're maybe uh, helping guides, whatever they hold. But like I said, for the most part, we don't have that desire for polytheism. Mm -hmm. It says, furthermore, it seems ridiculous that the crowning glory of human intelligence is the ability to see beyond the foolishness of multiple deities. There must be some aspect of the mitzvah that is more challenging. And by the way, you just saw thunder and light, you, know, you heard it. Some people would think that there's a thunder god in the, in the old days and a lightning god. So, you know, we don't have that. We're praising God for the natural events. Thor. Thor was a god of law, thunder, right? Lightning. There you go. Lightning or thunder? I don't know. Okay. So, Hashem is one, not composed of different parts. The Rambam writes that each Jew must understand that Hashem is qualitatively different from everything else we know. When we describe Him as big, strong, powerful, and holy, we attribute to Him qualities that we are able to grasp, but that uh, don't do justice to, to Him. Hashem is not a gigantic being composed of different parts, but an infinite being that we cannot comprehend. This is a valid aspect of the mitzvah, of Yichud Hashem, and since the Rambam includes it in his definition of the mitzvah, we are required to grasp the deep philosophical difference between the finite beings and the infinite one in order to fulfill this mitzvah properly. It is doubtful, however, that we will be required to walk around constantly contemplating the difference between the finite and the infinite. And one point about the Rambam's definition in his Mor Nevuchim, 
and others who give these definitions, it is very important to understand what we mean when we say God. That's why it's well worth going through the Rambam's first part of Mor Nevuchim. Or even if you want to go to Mishnah Torah, where he again uh, fle uh, fleshes out, if you will, <laughs> without any, uh, you know, no pun intended. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's very important to know that God is not this person with a white robe and a long beard and all the other images that we concoct when we're thinking of what Hashem is, but to understand what we mean. So that's why, you know, he's bringing down the Rambam, but he's saying he can't imagine that that is the constant mitzvah that we have to deal with, that we have to re recognize between the finite and the infinite. He says there's no other infinite being. Since Hashem is infinite, no other being can be like him. This too is a deep psych philosophical point that's important to understand but can hardly be the focus of the constant mitzvah. And, and finally, four, Hashem is all that exists. This is, difficult, this is a difficult point to describe in philosophical terms. If Hashem is all that truly exists, then what are houses, cars, tables, and flowers? Furthermore, what are we? Figments of imagination? Somebody asked me, how do I know I exist? So I gave the famous answer, I think. Therefore I exist, I said, but you, on the other hand, I have no idea if you're an illusion or not. <laughs> in reality, what it means is that all infinite in, uh, existence is a manifestation of Hashem's will. Everything that we interact uh, uh, or contend with, whether tangible or conceptual, must come from Hashem. This part of Yichud Hashem may sound as technical as the others, and when dealt with in the physical term, it may be. Philosophical. philosophical term, it may be, but in the practical day-to-day -day application, the level at which was at which is classified as a constant mitzvah, it can be easily understood, easily understood, but extremely difficult to implement. So now, if you go to the 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 note, it's a nice long note for us, but it's an important one. He says the philosophical background of this mitzvah is discussed in the classic works of Torah and thought and Kabbalah and is beyond the scope of this work. We present only what's essential for a basic understanding of the underlying principle of Yichud Hashem. So here we go. Before creation, all that existed was Hashem. The Rambam, at the beginning of Hilchot Yisodei Torah, which is again in uh, the, the, uh, in the um, Mishnah Torah, writes that all of creation exists only as part of Hashem. It has no independent existence on its own. In reality, then, relatively little has changed since creation. The universe came into existence only as a manifestation of His will, and it is still only a manifestation of His will. Until this very day, and this concept is nearly impossible for human intelligence to fathom, Hashem is still all that exists. Nevertheless, he has granted us a certain level of autonomy. Autonomy, first of all, in perception. He created us in everything in the universe with shape, form, geographical characteristics, human and animal organs, and so on, so that we no longer perceive ourselves as, manifest as emanations of the Infinite One, but as individuals, finite beings. Along with the perception that, of autonomy, Hashem granted us Bechira, this free will, mm. enabling us to decide for ourselves what, will, uh, what we will do. In most cases, He also grants us the ability to act upon our decisions. But the source of our existence has never changed. Everything always has been and always will be an emanation of godliness. The challenge of being placed into a physical body is that our perception of our autonomy has become so ingrained in our psyche that is very difficult to see past it, but we do have the capacity to do so. This is what drives the atheist nuts, this concept. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's because we are finite. So we believe everything must be have a beginning and an end. We can't imagine something that's greater than us. So he says, why did Hashem grant us this autonomy? So Mesil Yisharim writes that the purpose of creation was to enable us to earn the pleasure of the Vekas Hashem, the uh, cleaving to Hashem, 
and draws spiritual pleasure from the divine presence. One of the ways we can learn, one of the ways we can earn that pleasure is by recognizing the true existence and recognizing that we are truly part of it. That does not mean that we should only that we should see only Hashem when we look at material, physical things. When we look at a person, we should see a person. When we look at a table, we should see a table. If we begin to look at everything in the world as the manifestation of Hashem's will, we will be paralyzed by feelings of inadequacy. What are we and what can we accomplish? Instead, we should strive to realize that everything we see is really an aspect of Hashem transformed miraculously into illusor illusory independent beings so that we can face the challenge of perceiving that there are things that seem external to him and then slowly learn to identify them as part of the true existence, Hashem. The more we overcome the superficial perception and recognize with increasing clarity that there is nothing other than Hashem, the more pleasurable life becomes. The reward for overcoming the perception of the autonomy will be in the world to come, where we can cleave to, where we will cleave to Hashem with the absolute clarity that we were always part of Him. So really, we're set up. It's a setup here. We are in that we are finite. God gives us this illusion of free will. We have it to some extent. He's saying, but nonetheless, we have to look at this table, and we when we look at this table. Mike, everything is around us, then we have to remember, uh, start thinking that this is an emanation from Hashem that will bring, and uh, the more we see that, the more we realize that this is held together because Hashem said so, and we're held together because Hashem said so. So that's going to bring us to want to cleave to Hashem more and more and more, and not to distance ourselves. Okay, so now day 22. We're moving along. <laughs> day 22 already. Everything comes from Hashem. In practical terms, Yichol Hashem requires us to recognize that everything we deal with in life comes from Hashem and that the challenges we face do not come from external sources. We will explain this concept by examining the challenge most frequently associated with the perceived other side, namely evil. This is what your atheist friends are bothered by. Okay, this is what everybody's bothered by. It bothers everybody, but this is where the atheists say, if there's evil, it must mean that there's no God in the world, and so on and so forth. This is also where you're going to get the concept of the devil, because if God is good, how can bad be in the world, and so on and so forth. So this is what we're going to attack. Early philosophers felt it was unlikely that the same God who created heaven, earth, and the perfect systems of nature could also be responsible for all of the pain and the suffering in the world. They came to the conclusion that there are two forces, one of good and one of evil, and they constantly wage war via emissaries in this world. Good people are messengers of the God of good, and sadists and tyrants are messengers of some other force. Thus you have even in Star Wars, the, ah. the force and the other side, the Sitra Akra. What do they call the other side? The dark side of the, the dark force? Side, yes. Dark side of the force, fine. the word devil, I mean, the word evil with a D at the front. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. There you go. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. some sorry? Are there philosophers? Are there Jewish philosophers? Like, not like no, philosophers. Just philosophers. Right. In other words, the non Jewish philosophers. Right. There's not, if, if you were a Jewish philosopher, there wouldn't be much to philosophize about. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, I have to be very clear with this. Mm. If, you're an, if you're a religious philosopher, a re Jewish religious philosopher, so then you realize that there's only one, one source. Oh, I thought that's just a religious view. I thought that's just a religious view. Philosophizing means thinking of different ways of looking at an object. But no, and there was if I'm a secular philosopher, right. or if I'm a, a philosopher who's coming to religion on their own, whatever the case is going to be, I don't have the Torah to guard me. So then I'm going to say, well, there must be good and bad and and I'm going to create a philosophy. I'm creating on my own. Anybody connected with the Torah always understood right. that it was coming from God, good and evil. Right. So that's what I'm saying. I'm identifying philosophers, uh, religious, meaning orthodox, or bound to Torah, however you want to identify that, as compared to others. In other words, if you would look towards a guy, I'll give you a Jewish philosopher, who doesn't hold by this, namely... 
uh, he, he'll be happy I called him a philosopher, Kushner. Ah. Harold Kushner. He wrote the books when bad things happen to good people. He took secular thought, if you will, I guess. It's really, a, he's, his family should really pay, or he should pay, uh, money to Mordechai Kaplan, who is really the founder of that sort of thought, namely Reconstructionism. I, but that, because his book is basically just a dumbed down version of Jewish civilization, which is written by Mordechai Kaplan, at least his views of God are. And, but nonetheless, he held that God can't, cannot control everything. He also holds that God is not powerful and so on and so forth. It's a force of some sort, but limited power. Okay? And, it's, and so on, he gives his proofs. It's, we don't accept that. But that would be an ex example of somebody coming not from Jewish sources, even if they are Jewish, and doing what they want with that. So again, when I, this, when I, when I say Jewish, religious, I'm really saying code word for orthodox or of, that tradi of, our, of our tradition. In our tradition, we don't have that. Conservative reform may very well have, I don't think they do, but it's possible that they have that dualism. I don't think they do. I am saying only Reconstructionists is the one, and even they don't, but they don't accept God. So I don't think they all, I don't think they even have a dualistic approach. Hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm just going back to a class I took years ago about the various movements, Jewish history and Reconstructionism. And right. It's got the same tenuous relationship to Judaism that uh, I think the closest comparison is uh, Universalism. Universalism? Uh, from Christianity? Christianity. Tenuously related. Again, I don't want. I'm not looking to make fun. Each one of the groups had a reason for what they were doing, and they were trying to come at Judaism to talk to the people. So I'm not really willing to pick on them historically. What I'm saying is, but even with all of that, I don't think that they have a concept of dualistic two powers. I say, well, if they all look at. I know a reform rabbi, and I'm, I'm guessing she's representative of, of the movement itself, who said she doesn't understand why the Christians, or the, the non-Jews in general, can't get that God's responsible for everything. <laughs> so I'm guessing she was representative of her movement. And again, the conservatives certainly. So the only one I would question is Reconstructionists, but again, they are not accepting God the way we do normally. So they don't seem as omniscient, omnipotent, and so on and so forth. So you'd have to, you know, really explore that out. But in general, I'm talking about non he's talking about non-Jewish philosophers who saw two two gods or three gods or twenty gods, uh, but certainly the good and bad. Right. Okay. Like you call it as philosophers and there's religious Jews who have our the Orthodox, we have a philosophy, but we're not like Plato or Aristotle or But we did. We you have Maimonides who was a right. philosopher. Right. Yeah, a lot, we had a lot of philosophers, right. yeah, a, a tremendous amount, who Rev Sadia Gaon. They all were writing philosophical works to right. talk to people in philosophical terms. You had a recent vintage, Rev Soloveitchik. Right. He wrote the Halachic Man. He wrote a, a couple of books himself, all based upon philosophy. You have a lot of Jewish Orthodox philosophers, but the, if they work within our realm, then they know that there's no problem of two God systems. They know that God's doing bad. The question is, how, how does that work out? So we're going to deal with that. But that's really the question. How could they, if God is so good, how could it be bad? That's the, that's the problem that every atheist will throw at the, the Orthodox Jew. So now we have to have an answer. So here's an answer. So some philosophers, oh, I'm sorry, I read that. So it says, uh, the drive toward kindness is supplied by the God of good, temptation, right, from the, the other force. So Hashem Elokein or Hashem Echad means that both are false. There is only one God who is responsible for both good and what we identify as evil. So the second approach, that both forces exist in every person, is the issue that we are more likely to grapple with nowadays. We feel mixed messages being sent from, uh, to us from within. It seems as though, quote-unquote, good forces and equal or more powerful, quote-unquote, bad forces compete for our time and energy. On one hand, 
We, f- we want to find meaning in life. We want to grow. We want to take religion and spirituality seriously. At the same time, however, we feel some force pulling us toward instant gratification, toward a carefree life of fun and games. We come to the conclusion that living mean- meaningfully requires painful sacrifice. We resign ourselves to the fact that as soon as we perfect one area of life, We'll find another one to struggle with. We find we think that if we really want to be perfect, we must be willing to forego all the pleasures of, offered by the other force. We would really like to achieve both. In planning our long-term goals, we search for meaning. Long-term goals always focus on concepts that we truly believe in, on ideals and deeds that we want to be remembered for. In the short term, however... We would like some slack. We want breaks from time to time. We need time to free ourselves from our conscience so that we can just have, so we can just enjoy, enjoy some instant fun. That's what we want. The mixed messages often lead to a certain duality in which we focus on long-term goals when we feel we are dealing with major life-altering decisions, such as which neighborhood to live in or to which schools to send our children. But when it comes to the minor decisions, such as where to vacation or which forms of entertainment we can participate in, we feel a need, we feel an urge to encourage, to engage in some temporary pleasures, and we don't think of the big picture. Now, I want you to think about this. People go on vacation. Religious people go on vacation. Okay? Some people will be very specific, uh, very what we call mock pit, particular, to make sure that wherever they go, they're going to have a daily minion. They're going to have availability of kosher food. They don't want to schlep it with them. They're going to be having availability. They're going to have some sort of uh, connection with the Jewish community when they get there. So, and they'll, they'll, that's where the base will be. Others will say, I'm on vacation. <laughs> While they'll dove in, they won't be running for a minion. And they'll do whatever they have to do for Shabbos. But, so they'll be independent souls, but they're not really looking to connect. So he's arguing that that's not a good situation because you're forgetting the long goal, long-term goal. Long-term goal is to cleave to Hashem, nothing else. So if I, if I want to cleave to Hashem, so what I have to do is always be on duty, if you will. There's never a time that I can say, I don't need this. There may be times that we want to drift off and that we need those moments of meditation, so on and so forth. I'm not going to argue with all the Hasidic masters who went into the forest, but we're not them. Okay? We're not. We're lazy. That I agree with. We're lazy. We don't want to go to Minyan. No problem. But admit you're lazy. Don't say I'm doing it because I need to have, I, I need to go on a retreat. You don't need a retreat. Right? That's, that's what he's saying. Be honest with yourself. Realize what the long-term goal is. So we know that we, maybe I'm putting more words into his mouth, and so be it. But I think that's what he's trying to say to us. We know that we believe in Hashem, and that we want to live for a higher purpose. But we are overwhelmed by the quote-unquote other force, singling us to take some time off to enjoy the moment. And that force convinces us that we are not forfeiting our long-term goals. And it says, this is temporary, it whispers. This is just for today. Don't worry. You're still going to become perfect. Eat, drink, and be merry now. You'll do tshuva later. Famous line, right? Now, what does the Rambam say about a person who does this? Now, that pikoros doesn't work. No, that is, is it talking about going off the gear? So I'll, I'll go to this restaurant. And, uh... Not necessarily. You can start off slow. Huh? I won't go to Minyan. Oh. I, won't go to, I won't wake up early. No, I won't to. say to Hillel. No, no. But think, think what I'm saying. I, I, I have a schedule, right? So what happens? I stay up late one night. Oh, you're talking about now at home. I'm talking about vacation. Like the, I'm taking every time, wherever you are. Wherever you are. And again, I'm going on vacation. So what happens? Unless you want to go to an, an area yeah. to get away, and, and there's no close by at all. Okay, so he's saying you shouldn't do that. Ah. You're forgetting the long-term goal. Mm. And, but let's say I went to that community that had a minion and I still didn't go. Then there's no excuse. Because I, no, there is an excuse. I'm tired. Ah. I'm tired. 
<laughs> they go too fast. How many people, uh, come on, they go too fast. I'll give you all the excuses in the book. They go too fast. They don't have kavana. They don't really mean what they're doing. It's too early. They're, they're too early. It's too late. It's not, it's not in my schedule. I have to this, I have that to do. But I really, love to, I love the people who tell me that we're not, we're not serious enough for them. That's why I don't, I can't come to your minion. Because we're not, you're not serious enough in your tefillah. You don't use it properly. It's the time of the Gevorah. You're using this. They use all these fancy terms to say, I'm not going to come to Minion. I don't want to be part of your little game. <laughs> and I'm thinking, are you crazy? Are you serious? And I look at them like, you're not. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Don't, don't give me the baloney. Tell me the truth. I don't want to come to Minion because I don't want to come to Minion. That's all. I'll accept that more than I, I'm, on a, I, I'm looking for the high holy thing. No, you're not. If you were, you wouldn't stay, you wouldn't stay in South Bend. You would go to Eretz Israel and you would live there and find some community that fits your, your thing. Because that's where all the Jews are. That's where you have the, all the artsy fartsy Jews and everybody else. They have the meditative Jews. You have everything you want in Eretz Israel. Go to Eretz Israel and be a Jew there. Go to New York, be a Jew there. Don't stay in the South Bend. Don't stay in the Boston. Don't stay in the, uh, don't stay in, Ca well, California may have those Jews. <laughs> it's, it's possible. Okay, you have Jews like that in California? Who meditate? Yeah, the, the Kabbalah Center, there you go. Okay, so you have that. Okay, so go to the place you're going to get it. Don't stay here. Don't go somewhere else. But you have so many excuses why people don't want to do the, follow halacha. Follow the, and again, follow halacha in the best possible way. I'm not saying that any of them are not davening chas yeah. I'm not saying that any of them are breaking shop. It's chas I'm hoping everybody's being a good Jew. But they're not doing it with the community because they've decided, and this, this is the Yetzirah yeah, talking, they've decided that our community is either not good enough for them, not serious enough for them, too serious. By the way, it can also be the other way. Too serious for them. Too stringent for them. They can't take it. These people are close-minded. There's no community that fits everybody perfectly, but that's what makes a community. <laughs> but like I said, that's really what goes on. You have all this mishigas, but that's because you're not caring about your long-term goal. You're, you're very short-sighted. It doesn't fit my lifestyle right now. So it starts off very slow. That's what he's saying. He's saying, just for today, give it away. Yeah. Don't worry. You're still going to become perfect. Eat, drink, be merry. Fuller, go to the movies. Do what you want. And then you do tshuva tomorrow. Tomorrow's another day. And then tomorrow comes. And that force distracts us for one more day. And then another, and another, another. I add it. Before long, we may find ourselves reminiscing about the glorious past that wasn't, as many people do, because a painful reality is too hard to face. All this damage is wrought by what? By the other force, also known as Yetzer Hara. But Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, Hashem is our God, Hashem is one, means that there is no other force. The drive called Yetzer Hara, the one that will eventually cause us to regret all the time we wasted all the years we spent vacationing from our long-term goals is not a messenger from some external force. Mm -hmm. Who then is responsible for the Yitzhahara? The answer, perhaps, shockingly, is Hashem. Why would Hashem inject, inject such a seductive force inside of us? As we have seen, the purpose of creation is for humanity to earn the eternal pleasure of basking in Hashem's glory. Hashem gave us the Yetzirah to challenge us and to make us struggle so that we can truly enjoy that pleasure. And now here's what it's, he's going to get into a very nice thing. He says, as Sukkot was approaching one year, the people of Badichev were dismayed to find that no one had managed to obtain a kosher etrog for the use of the, fe for the festival. One day a visitor came to town and mentioned to someone that he had a kosher etrog. So the townspeople tried to convince him to sell them the etrog, but he flatly refused. Then they begged him to stay there for Sukkot so that they could use his etrog, because they would borrow it and so on and so forth. But he insisted he had to travel home. They offered him to pay him, but he wouldn't hear of it. They ran to the Rebbe, Rev, uh, Rev Yitzchak, uh, Rev Levi Yitzchak, famous guy, and begged him to convince the man to stay in, uh, in Bidichev, for Sukkot. <clears throat> Rav Levi Yitzchak asked the man whether there was anything 
that could get him to stay in Berdichev? Certainly, the man responded, if the Rebbe promises me that I will sit next to him in Olam Haba, the world to come, I will stay for Sukkot and allow everyone to use my etrog. All I want is to sit next to you in Olam Haba. He's worried about Olam Haba. Very good. The Rebbe agreed. No problem. Done. And the man sent a telegram to his family to let them know that he would not make it home for Sukkot. On the first night of Sukkot, the man went to pray in the main shul in Petitif and then waited, as was customary, for someone to invite him home for the Yom Tov meal. But no invitation was forthcoming. One after another, the people filed out of the shul and he remained standing there alone. What kind of a community is that? <laughs> he felt slightly embarrassed, but he had no choice but to start knocking on doors to request an invitation. He had, he had eaten a sukkah, right? So he went from one house to the next, but he refused entry into each home. He realized that something was amiss. He finally asked one of the homeowners, why doesn't anyone want me as a guest? The rabbi instructed us not to allow you to eat with us, he responded. <laughs> okay, you, get a, you may get a seat next to me in Gan Eden, but you're not going to get a seat next to me in this. <laughs> okay. So the man ran to the rabbi. We had to ask the Rebbe whether he could eat with him. No, the Rebbe answered. What have I done? Why doesn't the Rebbe allow me to fulfill the midst of eating and sleeping in the sukkah? Because you requested something that is beyond your reach, said Rebbe Levi Yitzchak. If you relinquish your right to sit next to me in the world to come, I will allow you to eat and sleep in my sukkah. The man thought about it and decided that it would be wrong to forgo the obligation to eat in the sukkah in order to merit sitting next to the rabbi in Olam Haba in the world to come. He agreed to relinquish his right to the privilege and was graciously welcomed to the rabbi's sukkah. Once he had settled and started eating, the rabbi said, Now I can grant your request, then you will indeed sit next to me in the world to come. When you first made the request, the rabbi explained, I had no choice to grant it because I wanted to have a netrog. But I knew that you would not enjoy, that's the main point, enjoy sitting next to me because you weren't worthy of that level. Mm. You would have been ashamed to be the lowliest person in that lofty place. Mm. By the way, this goes back to the beginning of the conversation. If that guy would have driven with my beat up nine, a 2000 uh, Dodge yeah. caravan with all the rust stains, and then I would have come out dressed even like this, okay? And I would have asked him for money. I would have been embarrassed to go to that guy, right? So because now that's why I drive with my Lexus. Well, he drove with it. I don't have the Lexus. He drove with his Lexus to get the money. Same thing here. He would said you would have been ashamed because you were of a lowly level. You weren't at my spiritual level to sit with me or, or my companions. <laughs> but he says, now that you have uplifted yourself by showing that a mitzvah is so valuable to you that you are willing to forgo your request, you will enjoy sitting next to me in all of Maba. Wow. So that's what he, he had to work for. It. That's the point. If Hashem would allow us to bask in his presence without earning, without earning it, we would not be able to enjoy it. We would hang our heads in shame rather than take pleasure in it. Hashem placed us in this world and gave us a Yetzirah so that we can earn our eternal reward by prevailing over him. As we withstand the ever-increasing challenges of the Yetzirah, we draw closer to Hashem and develop the ability to enjoy the ultimate pleasure of basking in his presence in the world to come. Our sole uh, purpose for existence in this world then is to come close to Hashem. The Eight Sahara's sole purpose for existence is not to distract us from serving Hashem, but to help us grow. His entire existence is one of illusion. His role is that of a coach who pushes an athlete to the extreme to help him attain success. When he says sin, he really means let me see you withstand my challenge and become great. The Eight Sahara may be seem like a nuisance, mm. but he sells tickets to the internal pleasure. Mm. You cannot grow without him. You cannot perfect yourself without being challenged by increasingly difficult circumstances. Most important, more importantly, he helps you to, to enjoy your time here on earth 
Without him, life would be empty and meaningless. The more you feel the challenge and are able to prevail, the better you feel about yourself. We'll have to stop there. On a good note of the Yetzirah, so we see the Yetzirah is not really bad. Hashem didn't implant him here to torture us, but rather to train us to be stronger and to have a closeness to Hashem.